بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Ask Iman broadcasted live from the studio of Iman channel on Sky 757 We're also live on our social media platforms so please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Facebook and Instagram page follow our Twitter handle and of course this program is also live on our website imanchannel.tv and to find out about any programs on Iman channel once again the website imanchannel.tv It's a live interactive Q&A program as you all know so I would like to humbly and kindly remind you our studio number 0203 5150757 alternatively you can drop us a text on WhatsApp or to our international viewers you can drop us a line on 0791684 and of course as usual you can drop us a questions on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page I'm your host Qamar al-Islam joining us today our regular weekend guest on Saturday internationally renowned scholar Fadilat al-Sheikh al-Dr. Muhammad Salah Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome back and thank you for hosting me Qamar al-Islam May Allah bless you and all the viewers I mean, Jazakallah Khair. Today, 11th of September 2021. Now, Sheikh, obviously, you and myself, and of course, all the people across the world um, have seen the news or so international news across the world, including BBC and CNN and all the other platforms. Of course, we have seen a lot of discussions and uh, events have taken place. Now, as a Muslim scholar, as a student of knowledge, you've got a lot of followers. People listen to you. People would like to find out your thoughts, especially when it comes to trillions of dollars have been spent. Millions of people have been displaced and displaced. Tens of thousands um, have been or hundreds of thousands have been killed. Um, many nations have been uh, disestablished. So I guess or I suppose your thought as a Muslim or in general, is world a better place to live now? If not, can Islam offer a solution. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen wa la udwana illa ala al-zalimeen wa sallallahu ala sayyidi al-awaleen wa al-akhirin nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd It is hard to say that the world today is a better place to live in due to the following facts. Fact number one Every community and every religion have its own homegrown crazies. You will find that in Christianity, you will find that in Judaism, you will find that in Hinduism, you will find that in Buddhism, and you will find that in Islam as well. Due to the misinterpretation, fanaticism, extremism, lack of understanding, and a common factor which is ignorance, racism, and prejudice. Uh, I'm not gonna be speaking on behalf of other religions or other cultural practices, but I'm here to present the Islamic perspective. From day one, we have been saying that Almighty Allah said, Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal maw'idati bil hasanati wajadilhum billati hiya ahsan. That is the ultimate way of giving da'wah and informing people, non-Muslims, about the Almighty Allah, about monotheism, which is wisdom, the good admonition, and in case of debates or argument, if it is inevitable, then also on the basis of kindness and mutual respect. Due to the following fact, it can never, and it is never permissible, to force anyone to accept your faith or belief or ideology. The Quran have made it very clear in this respect in multiple ayahs and positions. And likewise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what happened on September the 11th was definitely a very heinous act. Whether it was orchestrated by certain intelligences those who believe in the conspiracy theory, and they believe that behind that is not Muslims, definitely, not people who are living in caves, but rather sophisticated uh, technology and advanced technology 
uh, orchestrated for a particular politi political agenda, or even if it was done by some Muslims who do not necessarily represent the correct Islamic view. We know that at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib عنه, with the emergence of the very first uh, action of al Khawarij, Ali ibn Abi Talib refused to label them as kuffar. And Ali ibn Abi Talib delegated Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, in order to argue with them, in order to refute their misconceptions. In no time, in simply answering three of their questions, more than 50% of the rebels joined Abdullah ibn Abbas, they repented and they returned back to the rows of Muslims. So as a scholar, as a da'iya, as a preacher, as an imam, our role is to refute the misconceptions and to clarify to all Muslims, particularly the youth, ma ha ya sa'du tu radul ibn. This is definitely not the way that we're going to achieve the establishment of the Muslim state or a khilafa or invite people to enter into the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a fact that Islam is the fastest growing religion by the grace of Allah. Post September the 11th, I personally, as one of the people who live in, in the United States and live this very terrible and heinous act, we were very much affected where most people quit coming to the masjid due to the fear that they will be bombarded or targeted if they come to the masjid or shot at. Our mm -hmm. masjid had been uh, somehow missed the people through the trash, swine heads or blood. They have written some offensive statement uh, and graphics on the building of the masjid. Many of our sisters, <clears throat> the hijab were forcibly removed from them. And some people were killed in North America. As I said, every community and every religion has its own homegrown crazies. So this is not only uh, in a particular faith, but I don't want to repeat what I said. It's everywhere. We need to protect the societies from such people. The ultimate way of doing so is education is education. A lot of those fanatics whom we met from other religions and through interacting with them and inviting them to open houses in our masjid, they ended up accepting Islam and they become very good Muslims. Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. So let's talk about the constructive possible way of healing and recovering. It is never done by the military. It is never done by nuking whole nations that can never create peace, that can never make the world, and it will never make the world a better place. Rather, communication, communication, interfaith dialogue, and communication. And then, lakum dinukum waliyadeen. Another fact that whatever is happening in the Holy Land, in Palestine, in Al-Quds, does not justify targeting all the oppression that Muslims are going through in Palestine does not justify targeting or taking revenge from civilians anywhere in the world, whether in the States, whether in Europe, in Latin America, in North America, that is not simply permissible. Imagine if we have non-Muslims, if we have Jews living in a Muslim country, or visit in any of the Muslim countries on a visitor visa. They are simply immune with the, with the promise of Allah and his Prophet And his or her name is Mu'ahad. He's given a promise and a covenant to be safe and secure in our society. Then when we travel to live or work in any of these societies, we're also guests. Then when we immigrate and we get the residency, then the citizenship, and we vow to be good citizens, serve our families, our community, be productive, play a constructive role in the community, be a da'iyah, 
and a messenger of the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, in the place that I'm living in. This is how we're going to make the world a better place. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa'ala. Thank you very much, uh, my dear Sheikh, for that beautiful introduction. And of course, uh, Sheikh, you have shared your own thoughts, experience, and from your own understanding as well. And you've reflected from Quran and Sunnah. Of course, um, loss of life, innocent life is tragic and awful. And 20 years on, of course, the event is awful. However, since then, we have seen, especially as Muslim, the Islamophobia, how it has risen, how it is rising. And unfortunately, whether it be brothers or sisters practicing their deen, the amount of problems or troubles they're going through. And as Sheikh has mentioned, we are not allowed to take law in our own hands, of course. We have to respect the law of the land and we have to follow the due process. And inshallah, if there is any issues or challenges that we are going through, we need to speak to the relevant individuals, authorities, or people who are qualified to comment and perhaps to help and support us. But however, any innocent life lost anywhere in any part of the world due to injustice or oppression, of course, is something awful and is something tragic. And we don't want to see that. And of course, we want to see a better place in this world to live so that our children, our next generation, not only can learn, but also contribute to the wider society. Now, Sheikh, um, before we move on to the question, one final thoughts from you, um, because I've mentioned about Islamophobia. Um, I've mentioned about how visibly practicing Muslims are at the moment going through a lot of challenges, whether it be through airports, whether it be through customs, securities, etc., etc. Uh, and the other thing, especially in today's world, especially Muslims living in the West, teaching the correct aqidah, uh, the correct teachings of Islam to our children, sometimes may become difficult. What should we do? I'm sure during the time of Prophet and Sahaba, they were challenging periods. What did they do? Well, the ultimate answer and the ultimate solution is patience and nothing other than patience. Yes, becoming and being vocal and expressing our objection to the way that Muslims are being mistreated at the airports, uh, the official offices, is something that has to be observed, especially by the politicians and politically active uh, Muslims and our allies of non-Muslims. And these cases should be projected in the social media as an alternative to the mainstream uh, media. And I talk about it whenever I have an open house, whenever I'm giving a talk to the FBI uh, agents, uh, to the police officials, to the judges, to the bank uh, uh, officials. Uh, sometimes we have big open houses. We explain to people what Islam is all about. And I make certain to bring about the kind of mistreatment that Muslims in general, particularly the religiously practicing people are being uh, faced with, uh, confronting and suffering from for uh, an imam to be thrown at the airport. He's an American citizen or a European citizen, and he's held at an airport for six to eight hours or 10 hours uh, just to question him and search his luggage. He has rights like every other uh, civilian, but their rights are being disregarded and he deliberately or she deliberately being uh, humiliated to the extent that we have seen some youngsters, babies, toddlers, they say we hold them. They say, well, because their names are similar uh, to uh, some suspects' names. We're saying that not only in the 21st century where we have the very advanced technology where you can figure out the personality of the person through the eye prints, the fingerprints, and a lot of means, which will take only less than a minute. But I believe uh, the uh, stereotyping and bashing that Muslims all over the world have been going through is, uh, uh, is something programmed. It is not happening haphazard uh, nor accidentally. It is intentional. And this is a message that I'm delivering here um, where maybe non-Muslim officials are watching. This is not the way you earn the friendship many Muslims. You are only given an excuse to the fanatics, to the extremists, you see, uh, to react. And this is, it doesn't justify any misdoing though. 
But what we're saying is, as I just advised my Muslim viewers, communication and a da'wah to ilallah bil husna wal mawa'idah fil hasin al hasana is the ultimate solution. Likewise, human rights, all human rights should be honored and respected, not only of non-Muslims, not only of the secular and the liberal and the agnostics and the atheists, but also of the Muslims and particularly the religiously practicing Muslims. I request the whole world to let the moderate scholars, the true scholars, to educate the entire Muslim. Muslim Ummah, not to prevent them from doing so, because why preventing them? Simply, you're giving a platform to others who may be ignorant, not educated enough, kind of extremes, or whatever, uh, to invade the mind of the youth and to brainwash them. So we all have to put to join hands and cooperate, to cooperate in a way that will teach people how to live a better life through understanding that everyone is free to choose whatever faith or religion that they want to choose. And Muslims and practicing Muslims also have the right if a woman chose to wear hijab and walk in Eastern London, Central London or anywhere, she's practicing her right as a British citizen. That is her right to wear hijab, has his right to wear a beard or to wear a thobe to pray in the masjid without being questioned, without being followed, without being interrogated, as long as the person is practicing his deen or her religion without exaggeration, without causing any harm to any person in the community. And once again, I address my fellow Muslim brothers and sisters that whatever we said earlier of being good citizens in any country, European country, American country, non-Muslim countries or Muslim countries is simply a Muslim duty. The Quran have instructed us to do so. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated in the sound hadith, أَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنْفَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ He said, the most beloved and the dearest people to Allah are those who are more beneficial to people. He didn't specify to Muslims. As long as you're helping all people, all mankind, you are dear to Allah. In another hadith, in another hadith, the Prophet said, hasan. And be well mannered in your relationship with all people, not only with Muslims. And Allah knows best. Thank you very much, my dear Sheikh. We can continue this discussion, but of course our callers and our viewers take the presidency as it's an interactive Q&A program and inshallah we will return back to it. And of course, as Sheikh has mentioned, as Muslim living in the West especially, we do not want any special treatment. All we want is justice, equality and fairness, like any other individuals of the society. Inshallah, we'll continue our discussion, but before that, let's now move on to our questions. Let's take our first caller for today. Assalamu alaikum, brother Omar. Wa alaikum as -salam. Thank you very much for calling in. What's your question? So my question is, if one was a kafir, but then he became Muslim, um, and so he retook the shahada, but then when he took, but then when he took the shahada for being a Muslim, he thought that the meaning of the shahada was that there is no God except Allah. Uh, but of course, it's wrong because the actual meaning of the shahada is there is no God worthy to be worshipped except Allah. And so, yeah, is his, is his shahada valid um, or uh, is it not valid? Does he have to retake his shahada because he made a slight, um, because he thought that the meaning was there is no God except Allah. But the actual meaning is that there is no God worthy to be worshipped except Allah. So does he have to retake his shahada or something? Okay, stay yeah, on the line, my dear brother. Uh, Sheikh, is the question clear to you? Uh, it is clear, and uh, if you're ready, I can go ahead and answer. Yeah, please go uh, ahead. Brothers, uh, in Islam, the shahada is called the kalima. Kalima. And the word kalima in Arabic means a word. And a word in the dictionary means a single vocabulary that provides a complete meaning. So a word consists of letters inseparable from each other. Like the word, the word. Like the word eat or food, it's one single word. And a sentence is normally phrased out of several words, whether nominal or verbal sentence. And then in Islam, when you say, count with me, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, so six, wa anna 
Muhammadan, Rasulullah. We're talking about thin vocabulary, thin words. These thin words form a phrase which is known as the Shahada. All of them are known as the word, the kalima. You know why? Because I would say in the in the dictionary, e, each word consists of letters. If you remove any letter of the word, it doesn't become a word. It may provide a different meaning, unintended meaning. Likewise, those 10 words are inseparable from each other. For any person in order to become Muslim, he must pronounce the entire shahada. Not only that I bear witness, none have the right to be worshipped other than Allah, but also, and I bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah, is the final messenger of God. So let's say that somebody learned about Islam, learned about monotheism, and he he said the shahada on his or her own, and it was deficient. It was incomplete. Or a Muslim who's not educated enough gave somebody shahada, and it wasn't fully. What am I supposed to do? Say it again. Say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah. When somebody walks in to our masjid, our school, and says, I heard about Islam, and I want to become Muslim. It happened with me a lot during the live programs. Callers, whether from the UK, whether from the North, uh, from the USA, um, they happen to be flipping the channels. They hear about Islam. They say, I like it. Um, how am I supposed to be one of you guys? So I say, repeat after me. And I say that in English first, because what matters most is the belief that the person, he or she, knows the meaning of what they are going to say, what they are about to say. Then you can utter it in Arabic. If the person said it only in English, only in French, in Urdu, and said it correctly, is it sufficient? It is sufficient. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope the question is clear to you. Brother Omar, are you still on the line? Do you have any other question? Inshallah, I hope the question is clear to you. And thank you very much for asking such an important question. We have got literally less than three minutes, Sheikh. Um, let's uh, start with the question Sister Maimuna is asking on YouTube. What age should children be reading the glorious Quran? Um, that depends on the intelligence of your child and the keenness of the parents. I mean... Um, I think last episode I mentioned in one of my visits to Japan, I was invited by a Japanese family to have dinner. They were Buddhist, they reverted to Islam, and they introduced their children, Musa and Isa, four and three years old. At the age of four, I believe Musa was, was an older brother. He had memorized, 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 not only knows how to read, memorized two parts of the Quran. Juz Amma uh, uh, and Juz Tabarak. And I tested him in Juz Tabarak, I believe it was Surah Al Qiyamah. And he was reciting beautifully. They both learned with their mom online. They didn't have an actual physical teacher, it was all virtual, mashallah. And uh, the other uh, son, or three, was actually reading and have memorized some surahs as well. Very impressive. So if you see your son, mashallah, when you read in Quran, he's trying to repeat with you, trying to imitate you in the prayer, take advantage of that. Begin by teaching them the Arabic alphabet. Then the short, we never say the small, nothing of the Quran is small, but short chapters, easy words. And when they get used to it, then you reward them with the candy, with the games, or whatever, with a big hug, and uh, applauding what they did, and you can add another one. So there are Muslims living in some Muslim countries at the age of 14. They don't know how to read a word in the Quran. Why? Because their parents are still thinking, it's too early, Sheikh. It's too early. Why Japanese family reverts, they do not know an Arabic word, at the exactly. age of four, have memorized two paras. 
Jazak Allah khair, my dear Sheikh. Inshallah, we'll return back to you. If you're just tuned in, you're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel on Sky 757. We're also live on our social media platforms. And Alhamdulillah, I'd like to say thank you very much to all the viewers who have asked us so far questions on YouTube. Inshallah, be patient with us. We'll be definitely taking or answering your questions after we come back from break. And of course, our WhatsApp viewers have also our viewers have also dropped us text through our WhatsApp. Inshallah, the studio number once again 0203515757 and our WhatsApp number 079. 1684-1483 and of course not only you can drop us text on whatsapp our international viewers you can definitely call us using the whatsapp number and of course all the contact details are displayed at the bottom of your tv screen we'll be going for a short break do stay tuned with us we'll be right back in a few moments thank you very much Welcome back. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel. I'm your host, Qamar al-Islam, and in conversation with Fadilatul Shaykh, Dr. Muhammad Salah. Inshallah, we have been taking questions uh, through YouTube, and of course, you've called in. Now, we'll be moving on to our next question from YouTube channel. Sheikh, if you can kindly answer another question. We've discussed, uh, Sister Maimuna, we've discussed about the urine in our last or yesterday's episode. But follow on from there, there's another question that has come up. Um, if a baby has taken vitamin D drops... Um, is the urine considered to be najis? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, the fiqhi ruling in respect of the urine of a baby, in either condition it is impure, but the process of purifying this impurity differs depending on the age of the baby. So as long as the baby is still being breastfed and it's a baby boy, it will be sufficient to splash the urine impurities. In other words, you wouldn't have to wash the, your clothes, which have been soiled with his urine. Once the child starts uh, eating edible food, then at any uh, time the, the urine soils your clothes of the baby while you're changing the diaper or whatever, it must be washed off thoroughly in order to make sure that the impurities have been completely removed. Same way like you would clean your clothes if they had been soiled with the urine drops of an adult. Thank you very much for keeping it brief. And of course, uh, um, similar questions have been answered yesterday. So please, we are go not going to repeat it. Inshallah, please uh, see our yesterday's episode on YouTube or on our Facebook page. Next question from Brother Hamza. Assalamu alaikum. My question is, can one limit contact with parents if they have a history of emotional abuse? Um... When Al Imam Hassan, may Allah be pleased with him, was asked, can a person argue with his father? He said, not even with his shoes. And that applies to the mother as well. We need to realize the high status of the parents. Simply, if you travel throughout the Quran, you check out Ayah number 36, chapter number 4, Surah Nisa. You check out another ayah of Surah Al-Isra, chapter number 17, in Surah Al-Nisa, ayah number 36, Allah the Almighty says, وَاعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا So the first divine command is monotheism. Worship Allah alone and do not associate with him any in worship. What is the next in order? It was in the prayer. It was in the command of fasting or giving alms. It was ihsana, and being super kind to the parents. We find in Surah Al Ankabut as well, Allah the Almighty is saying that even if the parents were non Muslims, you still are obliged to treat them kindly and take good care of them. What about if they are not only non-Muslims, but they're working hard to convert me from Islam or hinder me from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah the Ummati says, وَإِنْ جَاهَدَكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِي عِلْمٌ 
فلا تطيعهما only if they struggle with you in order to uh, make you as a sick partner so Allah in worship do not obey them only in this respect yet still وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا give them a good company in the worldly matters they need financial help go ahead physical help yes your mom wants to go to the hospital absolutely I'm there I'm your servant so you are in the service of your parents at any time in respect of anything you say what if they're having certain mental issues or one of them and every time I meet they either humiliate me or curse me or whatever does this give me the right to ignore them and boycott them the answer is no but I would limit my contact with them to an extent where I know that they're okay they're safe they have enough provision they have what they need of the daily uh, on daily basis because the financial responsibility of supporting the parents is due on the children even if the parents are non-muslims so please brothers and sisters remember also the ayah of surah al-isra chapter number 17 وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا No matter how rude are some of the parents, still, they are your parents. If you believe in Allah, in His oneness, and you have to be rewarded on the day of judgment, you have to be very patient with your parents. You have to serve them to the best of your ability. They are your, they are your easy path to enter paradise. In the sound hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, رَغِيمًا أنف عبد أدرك والديه عند الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلم يدخله الجنة. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is making a supplication against somebody and he rarely did. He said, "May he lose, may he be humiliated." Who? A person who would have one or two of his parents alive when they reach an old age and he cannot enter Jannah. Paradise through taking advantage of this opportunity in serving them. So you understand from that when you have one of your parents alive, this is actually an advantage, an opportunity not to be missed. Jazakallah khair. We've got briefly very few minutes before we move on to the second break. Uh, let's take the call, next caller. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for calling in. I understand you're calling all the way from Chicago. Uh, thank you very much for joining with us. What's your question, my dear brother? Um, actually, what happened, we go to the masjid and then there I have all my friends and we do salam and mus musafa. So when we come back, we often come back together. And when we depart, so often we do salam and then we do musafa. And this is happening every time, whenever we meet we do salam and musafa and then we leave we are again doing salam and musafa so okay. my question was can we do musafa like two times so that is okay. the question or whether is it a with us since we are doing it again and again okay understood it's clear to us sheikh over to you yes akhi, it is permissible to do so and an abuse sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith whenever two muslims meet and they shake hands together. Their sins will fall from between their hands so long as they're shaking their hands, each other. So uh, you meet, you shake hands, and you sit in the meeting. And whenever you're about to depart, you say, Assalamu alaikum, and you shake hands again. That is permissible. There is no problem with that. Jazakallah khair for that. I hope the question is clear. And with regards to the parents' question, I'd like to keep it a balance. Um, Sometimes as children, we may misunderstand our parents. And that is a possibility or that can be a possibility. So, of course, best is to sit down with our parents. And if there are any misunderstanding, make sure let us clean the air. Let's move on to the next caller. Assalamu alaikum, Mrs. Tahira. Assalamu alaikum. asking you, hello? Assalamu alaikum, Mrs. Tahira. Thank you very much for calling in. Your question, we have to go to a break, so sorry for rushing you. Uh, you always rush for my question. Uh, I need okay, to go ask... Ahead, uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, sister. For our coming generation, they're, they're facing so many complex issues and uh, so many 
uh, we use only traditional and uh, same theories to teach them uh, we need to do lots of uh, research and search on islamic rulings as well like taqwa we can do uh, thousand of uh, interpretation but we don't be uh, I, can you tell the uh, sheikh uh, how to uh, how he will explain on this issue on issue of what how to do how to gain taqwa no i'm saying our coming generation they they uh, they face very very complex issues and uh, individually uh, they becoming uh, complex uh, uh, their personality com- becoming uh, complex and we we use the same theories and same uh, traditional way of teaching them we need to do lots of uh, research and search on islamic rulings and how to build uh, and solve uh, the problems with the you know b- building like for example building relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay i think the question is clear to us inshallah sheikh has heard you but sheikh will be answering this question just after the break and i promise you i'll stop the uh, answer um, i'll start the question with your question that you've asked us inshallah sheikh will be answering first your question and then we'll be moving on to other questions that have been sent to us via youtube channel and of course by um, our whatsapp you're watching ask iman live on iman channel on sky 757 inshallah if you have any question please feel free to join us by whatever methods you would like to join um, the contact details are displayed at the bottom of the screen or our youtube channel and facebook page of course are there inshallah we'll be right back in a few moments do stay tuned with us you're watching ask iman live on iman channel thank you very much Welcome back to the last segment of Ask Iman, live on Iman channel. I'm your host, Qamar al-Islam, and I'm in conversation with uh, Dr. Muhammad Salah. Before we went on to the break, Sister Tahira or Mrs. Tahira, she is our regular viewer, and of course, our caller has asked an important question. And if I've understood correctly, I'll just summarize it just for the viewers who've just uh, tuned in. Uh, it's basically our uh, next generation or the younger generation that are growing up a lot of misinformation are out there and people are doing their own independent research and perhaps they make a, they may come to a wrong conclusion based on their own research so i guess she is trying to find out what's the best way to pass on the correct information the right message to our younger generation and in general what how should we take or understand the rulings of fatwas of islam Sheikh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala nabihi wa mustafa wa ba'd. My answer may not be a typical answer, but this is an answer based on my experience. Muslim communities, particularly in the West, need to invest in their imams. Need to choose an imam who is highly educated, and if not, then they invest in educating him and providing him with the enough fund to pursue continuous education and make certain that he's up to date and he has, he is well informed not only in the field of memorizing the Quran and knowing the meaning of the Quran but also psychology and the 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 uh, require a necessary sciences of communication with the youth there is a huge generation gap and we can never ignore this reality i know how you feel sister even if you're not able to express about it uh, clearly but i think all of us realize that and in order to breach that gap and in order to close that gap and get closer to our youth you have to talk the talk and walk the walk and speak the language and now I, i do not necessarily mean to speak english to speak the language that the understand every youth nowadays is living in seclusion in a virtual world and that's why we see a lot of the youth they barely socialize even with their family members because their friend their family has become the online the smart device they spend most of the time there and because of that the imam was given a khutbah in 15 minutes on friday This is a golden opportunity. It is not sufficient to say any 
or to repeat yourself. You gotta be very eloquent and take advantage that you have captive audience in order to attract them so that they would come back Friday evening. If you have uh, evening classes, invest in your imams, invest in your teachers. Enough uh, shopping for a half a sob. A person who is very obedient, knows how to recite the Quran very swiftly so he can lead us in taraweeh and in Isha prayer. And that's it. It's such a failure. We do not just need a half a sob. We need a person who can guide our children our next generation. We need a person to be loved by everyone in the community. And if your own daughter, a teenage daughter, feels that she has a pressing question at any time, day or night, she will pick up the phone and she said, she said, she would say, Sheikh, I have a pressing question. May you please help me? And he would not hesitate to say yes and answer the question. And if he doesn't know the answer, he promises, certainly I'll find out and I'll get back to you. This is a successful imam. This is a magnet who would attract the youth and be able to refute their misconceptions. Open-minded imam knows how the youth think and how to respond to them and answer their question. That is my answer. And that is the solution. And instead of saying we need to make researches and find out how to convey the message, the imam is the greatest investment. Invest in your imam you invest in your children. Invest in the teachers in the Islamic school and the Sunday school. You invest in the next generation. Wallahu alam. Thank you very much for that. And I'll just like to add uh, one more point there. All the responsibility does not lie only on imams or shiuch. As parents, it should be our responsibility as well that we need to be friends with our children so that we can understand what they are thinking, what they are looking for. And if there is any confusion, we're just not ignoring it, but at least signposting it towards the correct uh, procedure or towards the correct person, inshallah. Uh, it's very important to have a very healthy relation um, with our children. Uh, Sheikh, next question from YouTube. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, for the journey of knowledge, should I start to memorize Quran first with the English meaning, or should I memorize the Quran first and then learn Arabic? Your thoughts? Well, I do not see any problem in doing both simultaneously. Alhamdulillah, whenever you have the will, then Allah Almighty will make it easy for you. مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَبْتَغِي بِهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ In my school, which I started in, uh, in the States, I actually had two schools there, mashallah. It wasn't sufficient for me to put the kids in a health program, and that's it. I never uh, thought just producing half of is an ultimate goal was a sign of success. No, not necessarily. So that's why the child will memorize his sadaq on a daily basis, and along with it will take 10 vocabulary with their derivatives. By the end, in a couple of years, you're already speaking Arabic, and not any Arabic. You're speaking the classic Arabic. You know what the Quran means. You know the, similarly what the hadith means. So I believe it is very important, along with memorizing, you grasp on the meaning of a few vocabulary every day on each page, maybe 10 vocabulary. MashaAllah, by the end of memorizing the Quran, I can assure you, you would definitely know the Quran better than many Arab who did not study the Quran. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, or the author which is narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar and whether the Prophet said it or Abdullah ibn Umar said it, it can only become knowledgeable through seeking knowledge. Thank you very much. A beautiful answer there. Next question from a sister on YouTube. Uh, what are the ruling or what is the ruling of Muslimah to wear an abaya? Is it permissible to wear a blouse with skirt as long as it is loose and not transparent? Sheikh. Well, the guidelines, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in the ayah, whether 59 of Surah Al Ahzab, chapter number 33, or 31, chapter number 4, uh, 24, uh, Surah An Nur, Yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna dhalika adana ayyu arafna fala yuzay. If you're 
clothes are roomy, not tight. Opaque, even with different colors, not necessarily black, any other color. Uh, not see-through, not describing the details beneath the clothes, covering the entire body according to vast majority of the scholars with the exception of the hands and the face. That's called modest. So whether you wear a ba'a or a long garment that is doing the same, fulfilling the same purpose, it is okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Uh, it's a very unusual question, if you can kindly keep it brief, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. I know a worried brother who cheated his first year in college but repented later. Should he drop out? Has the degree and the future income from it become haram? Um, may I correct a common misunderstanding in the mind of some Muslims? They think that if somebody, uh, one of his exams happened to cheat or degrees, uh, then he has taken a job, so he believes or they believe that their income is haram accordingly. Let's not confuse the issues. Cheating in an exam or in selling or in buying in a degree is absolutely forbidden. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man ghasha falaysa minna. Taking a job based on your profession, excelling in the job and earning your salary, in many cases have nothing to do with the actual degree that you possess so if your employer is happy with your performance and mashallah you're being even promoted and getting a raise then your salary is halal your income is halal what you've done earlier does not affect the earning based on the fact that what you've done earlier is haram we do not doubt that and you have to repent from that and seek forgiveness that's a, a separate sin but the job that you're doing, it depends on your performance. If you're performing very well, and if your job is accepted by your employer, then your earning and your income is halal, akhi. Thank you very much for that. And uh, inshallah, we've got bigger things to worry. So hopefully, inshallah, the viewer will understand. Um, today, it's 9-11. And there's a very interesting question from Muhammad Sharif. Why are today's Muslims so divided and always ask, what type of Muslim are you? Referring to what mazhabs or what kind of school of thought you follow. Uh, briefly, your thought, Sheikh. Well, what you're saying is true, but it is not general. We do not generalize. For the past 17 years, I've been appearing on television, presenting live shows on various TV channels. When some people ask me the, the question, do I have to be a Salafi or super Salafi? Would I have to be uh, following this particular school of thought to become a Muslim? I assure the audience, and I'm saying once again, whether you have a name or you don't, what counts is your actions, your belief. So you do not necessarily have to call yourself a name. You do not have to take a bay'ah with the Muslim Brotherhood or with the Salafis or with the Sufis or with the whatever set or group or party to become a good Muslim or an ideal Muslim. Akhi, a man came to the Prophet وسلم, a Bedouin, and he said literally in the hadith, Ya Muhammad, this Bedouin, tell me what Allah wants for me. So the Prophet ﷺ said, five daily prayers. Unless, illa anta tawwa, unless if you voluntarily want to pray extra before and after nawafil duha, with night prayer, it's called extra nawafil. To fast during Ramadan, unless if you want tawwa, to fast, voluntary fasting, extra. Hajj is only once in lifetime, etc. <coughs> So the man said to the Prophet ﷺ, I swear to the one who sent you with the truth, I shall not do more nor less. I would only do what you said of the fard. The five daily prayers. Jazakallah. The fasting during Ramadan and Hajj once in lifetime and pay my zakat. As the man was leaving, the Prophet ﷺ said, you guys, if you like to see a man who will be from among the people of Jannah, look at this man. Okay.
Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Unfortunately, I had to stop you there. But inshallah, I promise you, we'll continue our discussion in our next week episode. Apology for rushing you towards the end. And my dear viewers, apology to you. Uh, we haven't been able to take all your calls or questions uh, from YouTube or WhatsApp, unfortunately, due to the limitation of time. However, inshallah, uh, in our next week episode, we are back again live on Tuesday at 8 p.m. on Iman channel. Please feel free to let us know your question. Either you can drop us a text or through YouTube channel or Facebook page. Until next time, subhanakallah, muhammadik nashhadu wa la ilaha. إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والسلام عليكم.